Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for February 27th, 2023. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to, de to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is using the Trusted CI framework to create the CFDE cybersecurity program with Rick Wagner. Rick is a principal research systems integration engineer at UCSD and was the one of our 2021 Trusted CI fellows. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the presentation. Um, go ahead and type those in the chat window. I'll be following along. And with that, I'll hand things over to Rick. Rick, welcome. Thank you, Jeanette. And it's great to see everyone who's shown up. I see some folks from past SDSC and a couple of folks from the CFDE, including the cybersecurity team I've had the pleasure of working with. So with this, give me one moment and I will start my slideshow and start telling a story. And share screen, go. All right, Jeanette, can you see my screen? Yep, looks good. All right. Um, as Jeanette said, uh, if you have questions, um, drop them in the chat and Jeanette will keep an eye out and help to get my attention. Um, this very much sometimes, uh, you know, it's very topical to answer the question as we're going along. And sometimes I'll forget to mention something uh, and someone will ask something relevant. So please. Um, and then we'll, of course, have questions at the end. So this is about a non-NSF usage of the trusted CI framework to develop a cybersecurity program. And uh, what you'll hear is that the CFTE is an NIH project. And as I have worked in security-related efforts supporting research projects, um, I chose to be become a trusted CI fellow. I had the opportunity. And the trusted CI framework came out at a very opportune time for the CFDE, the Common Fund Data Ecosystem. Um, as you see, I am a the I'm at UCSD. The CFDE is the classic multi-institutional um, type of project, and I am the information security officer, which is one of the musts from the framework of having a designated lead. You're going to see these notes dropped in various places. Um, see somebody. Okay, it's just the slides. All right. So another title for this could be From Ambiguity to Action. The nature of the CFTE um, in the type of service it provides, the data it holds, uh, its contractual obligations, various things made it unclear what level of security compliance and implementation it needed to be a successful project. And this is something that's felt by a lot of research projects, large and small. And I'm hoping that I can describe how the framework helped me and the project get our heads around what we should be doing. All right, so what is the common fund data ecosystem? And since not everyone here deals with NIH programs. Uh, you should understand the NIH is very, very large uh, in its relative funding, in the type of work it funds, and the common fund in particular is one of the, it's tied to one of the offices of the director that supports high-risk innovative cross-cutting biomedical research. So this is stuff that isn't directly tied with one of the existing institutes like um, at NHLBI, the Lung Blood, uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, or National Cancer Institute, Institute, and stuff like that. It's where they want to bring together a lot of disciplines to do stuff that can have a high impact, but may require some dedicated funding for these type of projects. The way these projects work is there will be data coordinating centers that work with large collaborations to manage the data. So if you imagine the Human Microbiome Project that uh, 
looked at the gut microbiome and other aspects of our bodies that we weren't um, as aware of, you know, they gathered a ton of data across institutions and it flowed to sources at University of Maryland, UCSD, and others. And the data coordinating centers host that data for the researchers on the project and then release it out more broadly. Because of this, the data goes everywhere. And as a outside researcher who's not closely tied to the project, it's often hard to find and work with these multiple data sets. So the Common Fund established the Common Fund data, eco data ecosystem after a prior effort with the goal of enabling data discovery and reuse. So the CFDE has several activities. The primary one that's the focus of the security efforts is the Common Fund Data Ecosystem Coordinating Center Catalog. This is a portal for searching across DCC data. And the Coordinating Center is the group that I work with that uh, drives the other activities, including cross-pollination work to uh, facilitate discussions and work between DCCs. There's cloud activity, uh, training, and data discovery work, uh, and then user support for researchers. So the DCCs tend to have a lot of common needs in terms of their researchers. And so the CFTE Coordinating Center provides frontline user support for them. But for the most part, what we're interested in to start is the catalog, the CFTE CC catalog. And this is somewhat unique and that it the DCCs describe their data and other resources in it goes into a centralized catalog. So this is not a data warehouse and there is no data replication. The CFDE catalog does not store the data. And it, what it does is when the researchers find data sets of interest, it redirects the users to the DCC to retrieve the data and work with it. Um, it's operated in AWS by the coordinating center, uh, which is the group that I work for. And there is a curation flow, a process by which the DCCs submit, review, and manage their metadata submissions. Um, and if you ever think about, if you've ever read a set of rules and you've thought, gosh, you know, the all of these rules refer back to a story. When somebody's told, you know, uh, you can't wear blue flip-flops by the pool or something, there's some reason for that. So those bullets on the right, particularly the ones about not being a data warehouse, no data, re data replication, and directing DC users back to the DCCs, that's because as we tried to describe the role of the catalog, we constantly had to have discussions about what we were doing, that we were not providing direct data access, that we were not hosting the data. And then you get into this question of, okay, well, how sensitive is the metadata? Does it have PII in it? Um, what could you potentially do with it? Things like that. So as we're going through this, this started in 2020. So we're going to focus on primarily the year of 2020, when the I started in the role of security officer and the project was going through its really big ramp up phase to establish its processes. Um, and so you notice that this is before the framework was released. So when we look at the data and other things for the data we host and the systems that it's operating under, the CFDECC. So this is not CUI. Um, there's metadata about a lot of common fund genomics research, and there is the genomic data sharing policy. If folks have heard of dbGaP or other policies, this is all related. Um, and there is a potential that the DCCs with these study participants, people who have donated or contributed uh, their biological samples or other information to the DCCs, there could be a data use agreement that is tied to a consent that could flow through, but it's not clear. The contract itself, because we know nowadays a lot of times our security postures or our compliance obligations, et cetera, are derived from our contracts. And 
So you have FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, and you have grants. Those are probably the two that a lot of our group are members are the most familiar with, but this is under an OTA, another transaction agreement. And so that's distinct from things that fall under, fall under FAR, which could include federal systems because you're directly contracted to provide services or grants, which are much more open-ended. And we had some other needs, like we will hear in a bit that we were required to work with some of the NIH central information technology systems, including the research or auth service. And there were there was language in some of this that we may require an ATO. And if we're dealing with one system, there could be another. So the categorization is like, well, maybe it's related to genomic data. We may not have any contractual obligations, but what should we do? And I reached out. I was very fortunate that there was a security officer at the NIH for one of the institutes. And I asked him very explicitly, what are we required to do? You can always do more, but sometimes you want to know like what's in the contract, because if that's in the contract, we can go to the program officer and say, you've got to fund us to meet the contract. And, you know, he gave me some basic guidance. Look, if it's a FAR-based contract, especially to provide, you know, systems to the federal government, it's going to be FISMA and FedRAMP and the NIH and the various institutes um, have processes to provide ATOs. Um, in fact, NCI, the National Cancer Institute, you can find document, documentation online that they provide for going through an ATO process with them where they give you templates and they'll actually do some of the reviews because they have a lot of experience with that. If it's a grant or a cooperative agreement, the requirements from the NIH side are much more limited and it's expected that the grantee um, meets the risk management needs for their project. And then there's where we were at, which is the OTA. And I had to read the original agreement that was signed by University of Maryland School of Medicine, which is the prime on the subaward I'm on. I had to read the NIH guidelines on the OTA. Um, and then fortunately, as the security officer agreed, that it all depends on what's in the OTA. And for the most part, if it's open-ended, it looks more like a grant, but there are different projects that the NIH has funded where they want some explicit risk-based language in the OTA, which may include up to and including an ATO um, with particular guidance that maybe you, know, you need to meet this set of controls or other things. Um, but that was not an ROTA, but it could be. So I started to get the lay of the land is like, okay, contractually, there's no strong hooks, um, but the data we're hosting may bring some of its own burdens with it. So as I the conversations went on, as we were preparing for 2021, when we were expected to start meeting some of this, uh, we had an initial discussion with one of the security officers closer to the common fund, because that's the other part is, while groups like NCI, NHLBI, and others have more experience with this, uh, the common fund, because it's part of the office of the director and other areas, don't typically provide work with the concept of ATOs and other stuff. But initially, our program officer kind of only knew the word FISMA. Um, that was the language that they were familiar with. And so that was what they were most experienced with thinking of. So we would ask, like, if we went this route, who would be our authorizing official? Um, and because we're a new project, you know, if we're looking at one to two years, because our OTAs tended to be one to two years, do we really want to target an ATO, which is supposed to be a longstanding document, um, in the next year? This seems kind of like a big stretch if the project doesn't know if it's gonna have ongoing funding. And we really wanted to avoid um, a huge amount of work for unknown levels of sustainability. And you can see this thing where it says R. Wagner. This is borrowed from my bullet points from one of those presentations. I started to say explicitly, my opinion is that I'd rather see us work directly with the NIH 
on a security agreement and a plan rather than specifically just a new ATO because that's what people know. There's lots of stuff that we have to work out, categorization, roles, who has responsibilities, things like that, who does the audits. Um, and then, you know, what do we do in 2021? Um, do we just say like, because we're in the cloud, we start targeting FedRAMP, are we going to have to move our systems to go cloud? You can see kind of the, the questions that were coming up as part of this planning process. So like a sip of water. All right, so as we were entering 2021, this is, so we're in 2020, we're drafting our roadmap and we're writing our statements of work and things like that. So we had an obligation to integrate with the researcher auth service. And this was done, um, is kind of a unique ways because part of the integration is done through Globus, but we're actually handling some of the information that comes down from Globus. And we were both required to have an ISA, even though Globus has the direct connection to RAS. Um, and so now we've got to ask, all right, we're a multi-institutional project like many, who is the signatory? Um, and originally the language of the ISA said that both sides were expected to have an ATO. So now we're looking at, well, does Globus need an ATO? Does the CFTE coordinating systems need an ATO? Um, and then who's the signature? Uh, I don't think I could sign it as a sub-awardee for the project. I don't think that I can take on that kind of risk. Um, and so we started to draft our original deliverables, which was let's, let's do a security assessment so that we have an understanding of where our systems stand now. Let's see if we can get a reasonable categorization of the level of data handled by the system and develop a roadmap. So it's kind of an open-ended place. So as we entered 2021, I was really trying to find the right processes to work with this. Um, I was looking at the NISC risk management framework. Um, I was looking at CMMC because the word maturity definitely seemed to fit here that we needed to start somewhere and get somewhere. And then I was reading a lot of white papers from different companies. And I will say I did find some good information from Compliance Forge. They really helped pro provide me a way to think about, you know, you've got a lot of different potential requirements. How do you then choose controls and other activities to address them? But I was just really not sure where to take us. And given that the NIH Common Fund, this was not something they had done before. They were not providing clear guidance. And, you know, we're mostly a bunch of researchers trying to build a system that enables more research. And there's just a few of us, my, myself included, who had some experience with security. So that was where we were at entering 2021. March 1st, the framework implementation guide was announced. Um, I'm still trying to figure out if I was aware of the framework beforehand, but I definitely remember Von Welch's email um, coming out on March 1st and said, hey, here is a guide. Here is something that can get you started. And so uh, as the slide bluntly says, uh, I ran with this. Absolutely. Um, when I read the 12 musts, it, you know, to use the term framing, whatever, it gave me a structure to approach this that really seemed to address our needs because we weren't being clearly told that we had specific contractual obligations or regulatory obligations, but we knew because of the type of data we may be interacting with and our goals of potentially providing data set discovery, including PHI using uh, or PII using phenotypical information. So identifiable queries down the road. It's like, we need to start this process so that our system can be trusted in the future. So um, to give you an idea of this is, you know, it comes out on March 1st, I read it, and the slides that I'm gonna show you are some annotated ones where I put notes in, but this was something where I gave to a uh, Monday morning touch base with NIH program officers on March 22nd. 
So within three weeks, I had incorporated the thinking of the framework guide to describe what I thought the trusted CI or the CFTE security program should look like. So the idea was to formalize it. You know, we we needed a direction, and this is the way we chose to go. First, we laid out this concept of the security program enabling trust. You know, that thing about boundaries is we wanted to say, like, there's a lot going on around us, and we have to have scope, and we're going to focus on the portal, which is where the data flows where our systems are, and where we can apply our policies and processes to the data and information that we hold. So you can see here, like, this is part of the ecosystem. Um, Lee Liming is on the call. He drafted this. I thought it described things very well from our side. So everything inside of that oval in the center is what we were really focusing on. And following the guidelines of the framework, I, I took that mission alignment that really made a difference in my thinking. It answered the why. Why does the CFDE coordinating center need a security program? You know, and the way that I think about this, and I've mentioned this in other conversations, is when I think about the priorities of a security program, I tend to think about the perhaps ridiculous, but the catastrophic failures, like what are the things that would end this project? And that's really where, you know, you start and build out from. And so for the uh, CFTE, especially the coordinating center, is there were two groups whose trust needed to be made at all time. And the study participants, the ones that are contributing their parts of their literal lives to the medical research, some of that Basically, there, that information flows into our systems. It's very indirect. Most of the information we host is actually public and unrestricted. But as we move forward, if we ever were to provide um, identifiable queries and such to researchers, we'd want to ensure that that data was treated you know, reliably and securely so that those study participants knew that whatever consents they granted um, we're always there. So that's kind of an existential um, thought, but it's really respecting the, the people who um, we value the most. And the data coordinating centers, they, they are the stewards of the data that it, are contributed to us. And so really we need to have them trust us at all times. So the way I could see a failure mode for the CFTE, uh, at least especially the portal was if the coordinating centers ever felt that we were not handling their data properly, representing it correctly, um, enabling them to review and correct their submissions, it would fall apart. We're literally reliant. They are the it's their data that makes the portal enable researchers to discover um, data sets. So fundamentally, is like started with this. We have to protect their trust, and so this guides us. It's like okay. When we're making decisions, those are the key things. As long as that is up front, that's the highest priority. And all these other activities drive towards that. So it's not the control set wagging the dog. Um, you know, it's the control set does something. It has a purpose. So this is that's this is that's the why. Um, and then because I like you know pithy things. Um, and stuff like that. I made a motto, and that was no surprises. You know, this is this couldn't be a black box, opaque process. I couldn't just go into a hole and write documentation and come out six months later and drop it on the DevOps team and go to the NIH and say we're done and stuff like that. So no surprises. And this is the stakeholders, and this is another must: is identify who you need to work with. That was incredibly helpful because it's like okay. You know, we've all heard of racy diagrams and other things, but who do we need to communicate to and what do they need to know? So the DevOps team needs to know that there is value in the work that they're doing to improve the security posture of the systems and when it needs to be done so it goes alongside their work. Also, uh, as I mentioned, the University of Maryland School of Medicine uh, Matt Kramer, I saw, is on the call. 
this is sort of what became clear to me is they're the prime university of maryland som were the ones that were the lead we were the subcontractors so if i could develop a relationship with them you know they need to be comfortable with what we're doing so that they don't know that there's some rogue research group out there handling data that puts the school of medicine at risk um, and is taking on liability so we want them very comfortable and aware of what they're doing they don't need to operate the system, but they need to know that they've got insight into it in our process, and they knew who to reach out to if they have questions. So we began having bi-weekly um, touch points. Likewise, there's the DCCs, the users, users, we have privacy statements on our website, um, program officers, the NIH needs to know that we're doing the right thing, et cetera. So this all came from reading the framework implementation guide, and I said, running with it. So this is a couple of other, uh, this is the, you see the two calls, those are the annotations. Um, so we weren't starting from scratch, but this diagram, this kind of ramp up diagram, I think is very relevant for a lot of projects when they're approaching security. Because, you know, when you think of, if you haven't gone through an ATO process, I assure you, it is a ton of work um, and it can involve a lot of people and it can involve a lot of money where you start with an order of a million dollars and go down a little or up a little depending on your capabilities, et cetera. I knew that we had to sign an ISA. I knew that that would come with requirements in terms of meeting some controls, improving monitoring, et cetera. What I did not know is if we would ever actually need to get to an ATO. And so I had a definite requirement and I knew that we had existing processes and some very capable team members. So I wanted us to get to the definite requirement in a reasonable amount of time with the appropriate amount of work. I did not want to overshoot um, and go for the higher level requirement, which as I'll say later is still not required. So if you overshoot, you put efforts into something which is not the appropriate amount of resources. So I think for everyone who's starting, you know, as you develop a plan, do what you need to. Don't try to undershoot the bar, but also don't overdo it. That's that's a very big risk when, um, you know, when I think about people's reaction to security, I think of like a baby startle response. You know, they're not familiar with it and they jump and everyone goes into fight or flight. And that's not always useful. So by the, this is uh, what I was communicating in March. And so we made a plan. We chose our baselines. We went, followed the recommendation. Um, I spoke to Maryland and we agreed that the CIS controls were a much better starting point than trying to bite off all of a, you know, NIST 853, which would have been our target. And I communicated to the NIH that, look, we're not ignoring um, NIST. We're just starting with a specific set that's better for our project. And it starts getting us there and we can ramp up. And that the key thing was for us to establish this program, start building our documentation, and then figuring out what else we need to get to the ISA. I used a lot of the template documents from the framework. This was also incredibly useful. And there were uh, actually somebody from IU's CACR provided me with a copy of their strategic plan, which was an excellent reference because I realized that it only had to be a few pages. There had to be a plan. It had to call out what we were doing over the next year. Um, and to give us some guidance. And then I could start working on the other things like having the master document, which was incredibly useful. And then I had some trackers, which I'll show you some screenshots of, of managing where we were and where we were trying to go. So I do recommend the framework templates, especially the strategic plan and the MISSP and four groups that have existing policies and procedures your MISSP may be your primary document because you can then reference a lot of other things that already apply to you, say from your university 
um, or other organizations. So this was my uh, timeline. This is, as everyone knows, you make a plan and then you see how it goes. So in March, I was saying, let's kick this off. Let's draft our documents, begin control implementation, um, and see if we can do that over the next several months. And then towards the end of 2021, do an assessment, make sure that we communicate that with everyone, and then do any remediations so that we can sign the ISA. I see Jeanette sharing the templates. Yes. Um, and I'm, and by the way, some of my documentation I'd be willing to share as examples, including our strategic plan um, and a snapshot of the tracker I used. So the processes I used were a little bit formal and a little bit informal and more of my personal mechanisms to drive this. So like I said, some simple trackers um, and lots and lots of communication. Because of the ambiguity or uncertainty around what this project should be doing, um, I wanted to basically say, this is what we're going to do. If you don't think it's right, please tell us. And I've heard this described in different ways, but I was on a call with somebody who's done this in biomedical areas. And we were speaking with different executives from their university and the CISO from their university. And after the call, the person told me is, look, the way these calls go is they will never say yes, but they will absolutely say no if they see something that isn't right. Um, I use this very often when I'm trying to lead engineering discussions or other things is, I will say something because sometimes people are better at pointing out what's wrong than you know to point out what should be right. So I'm glad to throw out bad ideas. My intention here was not to throw out a bad idea, but it was a, to say like, look, we have a plan, we're executing this plan, but I want you to know about it. And I want you to give us feedback and input if you have any concerns or if you think we've missed something. Um, it's no guarantee that we'll catch everything, but improve the odds. So as I said, um, started having biweekly calls with the University of Maryland School of Medicine cyber team. Um, I would update the project leadership with what's going on. I gave a few presentations there. Uh, we had a couple more calls with the program officers and security officers, and they they agreed. Like because it wasn't clear what was required like that we would require to be an ATO, like because we're not a federal system, um, it wasn't explicit. And we're not currently holding the type of data that would require a higher level of security. It's like, let's put in just the right level of effort. Um, I also, because I came more from the DevOps and engineering side, I still work closely with them and we make plans. It's like, we're doing testing right now that's moderately invasive. And so it's like, can we touch the staging system? Is it okay? Um, we rolled out monitoring agents onto all of our EC2 instances that report back to UMB. And it's like, most people get a little leery when you're doing that on their Linux servers, but we tested it, we work with it, and it's been non-disruptive. And from my experience in working with security at, at SDSC, at other organizations, is trying to not say no. This is the goal of this project is enabling research while still protecting the trust of study participants in the DCCs. So there, there, if there is something that is worthwhile, let's figure out how we can do it. There may be additional work required. There may be some additional thought, but don't say no up front. Avoid that knee-jerk reaction um, of just basing it all off of, you know, a narrow view. And as you go through figuring it out, things may go a little slower. And unfortunately, sometimes maybe you will end up saying no, but don't say it up front. Try to work with folks. So here, here are the examples of the trackers that I used. Um, the one that says the framework tracker, this I know there's now a draft. I know I asked for one um, very early on after I heard about it. And it was just, 
I wanted something that I could look at and know that how am I doing? Am I thinking about each of these things? I am probably stealing this straight from Craig Jackson and some of his descriptions of the framework, but it's, so this is an older one. Some of these are absolutely met um, at the moment, but it was, I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss a step in terms of covering my bases. And 12 musts are so much easier to deal with than all of the, like, these would eventually be covered if you did everything in the NIST risk management framework or some other, uh, you know, security program. But here it was easy to start. And I think a lot of research groups at different scales can start with these 12 and then decide, okay, how much more do I need to do? Um, and then the document tracker was making sure that because building the documentation made me talk to people, made me think about stuff, following each document as it was done really helped me know how far along the program was. Yeah, just a couple more slides. So where did this get us? So this was 2021. Um, as I said, like the writing strategic plan and the MISSP were incredibly useful. It described, helped figure out why we were doing security. It also helped figure out those, answer those questions about roles and responsibilities. So if the School of Medicine is the lead, they've got the primary contact from the NIH, they're the ones who can take the risk and sign the ISA. Well, that's why it's been excellent to work with their cyber team because that's who ended up signing it. Um, by thinking about this in terms of what are the actual, like any contractual obligations in addition to what are the actual needs um, of risk management, we still don't have an ATO explicitly on the roadmap. Our goal is to continue maturing our security processes so that we're prepared for the next step, um, et cetera. So we also, UMB did the internal assessment. So we're basically a bunch of external collaborators. There's most of the work is done by myself and some others from USC. And so the School of Medicine, they're basically coming in as outsiders looking at our processes and our systems. We revised the security plan and to improve visibility and to help think about longevity because um, I'm actually drawing down off the project, the School of Medicine, one of their team members is now part of the coordinating center to be help operate, basically just mature the monitoring and other activities. Okay, last slide. This is what the real outcome has been from using the framework guide, is it made security part of the regular activities. It made it so that everything was done in line. It's not a separate activity that is done on top of other things. It doesn't displace other work. It is done alongside other work. And by going through the steps in the previous years, rather than sort of double down just on control implementation, one of the things we learned was we really need to deal with the fact that we are a multi-institutional collaboration. People come and people go, and we need to bring them in outside of just a core DevOps group. So we've run things like incident response table, incident, res, incident response tabletop exercises, which have been as much training activities as they were actual assessments. We were trying to figure out like, okay, can the people that are on the front lines dealing with the website, the portal, the users, can they start to not be paranoid, but just a little observant and follow that, see something, say something. Um, we're gonna do a red team exercise in the coming month because it's not that we're going to do an in-depth pen test and be tied up for a week. It's, can we catch something obvious and egregious? Do our systems work in some way? And as much as I mentioned the earlier uh, thing about scoping around the AWS assets in the portal, well, even a couple of years ago, we started tracking and at least acknowledging, okay, what are our non-AWS assets? So we have a lot of data related to the project and other things that we rely on that if one of them was disrupted, it would impact the project. It may not you know, hit the data from the DCCs, 
but all these other activities going on, the training, the cross-pollination, they're using different services. Let's make sure that we know who has rights on them, um, who has, you know, who's paying the bill. Um, because if you've ever seen one of your websites go down because somebody didn't update a credit card, you know, it does happen. And so now we're looking at enabling MFA on different resources and as more capable capabilities are coming into the portal, we approach that in that non-confrontational way. It's like, okay, that's really cool. It's going to have a lot of value. Let's make sure that we can do that in a way that doesn't open up and expose us to other things. So I really do appreciate the framework. Um, it, it helped me get my head around things and not only develop a plan, but communicate a plan in a way that has led the CFTE to make it so that security is not a conversation every day. It's not something that people are worrying about. It's just something that we do, and we've got a cornerstone to build on going forward. So, all right. So, Jeanette, should I leave this slide up, or should I just drop back to a big screen of me and you? Yeah, you can go ahead and stop sharing, and I'll uh, I'll grab the screen. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'm going to share just some updates um, from Trusted CI while people are um, processing and, and, and typing in questions if they have any. So um, community updates. Um, our next webinar will be March 27th at 10 a.m. Um, our topic is manners, um, which is mutually agreed norms for routing security. Um, and and routing integrity. And our presenter is Stephen Wallace from Internet2. So if you're interested, in, uh, be on the lookout for the announcement to register for that. Also, I've been kind of hovering over the EDUCAUSE website. Um, the uh, Cybersecurity and Privacy Professionals Conference has been announced. It's, it will be May uh, 1st through 3rd in Bellevue, Bellevue Washington, um, but registration is not quite ready yet. So just uh, be on the lookout for that if you're interested in attending. And I'm going to stop sharing just so we can go over. Does anyone have any questions for Rick? Um, while people are typing, I just I wanted to comment. Um, I was nodding furiously when you were talking about sometimes you have to give uh, effectively. This is this is what I say. Sometimes you have to give people what they don't want so that they can tell you what they do want. <laughs> and that's just uh, affirming for me because that that happens basically in every. Uh, profession, I think, when you're when you're working with people and you're trying to get something done. <laughs> yeah, it and in this case, it's you know we had a fairly good idea that what we were putting forward as a plan was reasonable, but uh, you know there's there very much could have been something that we missed. So it's you know radiate intent um, rather than beg forgiveness. So. <laughs> yes, very good. Um, so we got a comment here. Excellent presentation. Can you give more details about our, how RAS is used for authorization? Do you use RAS to manage authorization groups? Excellent question. Um, thank you, Jim. And this could be uh, maybe a longer follow-up conversation. But in this case, so Jim, I know that you and several others are familiar with uh, federated identities and identity providers. So at the globus level, RAS is an additional identity provider. So you can log in to Globus using RAS and it becomes one of your identities. What happens in the specific basis of the CFTE as a particular Globus client is the researcher authorization service passes through a bunch of additional statements about the user in the claims. Um, and some of those statements are actually stripped away and discarded right away. This is the fact that RAS itself will provide um, authorization tokens, and we really don't want them because, we, as we said, we're not providing access to data. What we want to know is more about the users. So Globus discards them. Because the CFTECC also has a RAS ISA, Globus will flow through to the CFTECC client um, additional attributes. And these are for an individual, what 
what data sets do they have access to through dbGaP essentially? That's the current um, primary source of information. And what we use that for is not authorization, but in the portal, when a researcher is looking at data, if a data set, we know like the DCC has told us that this data set requires that somebody have a particular um, access to it or authorization, we can match that up to the information that's flowed through from RAS. So we use it to tell the researchers whether or not they already have access to a data set or they don't. So if you think about this, um, you're looking at a list of a bunch of data sets. Um, some of them would just say public, 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 and then some would say restricted, but if you have access to it, it will also indicate that. So it's as other groups begin to sign ISAs with RAS, um, then the Globus could also flow those through. Um, if you don't use Globus and you go directly to RAS, then you get the whole payload which is based on the GA4GH um, standard. You're welcome. Okay, I think we're ready to wrap things up. Um, I wanna thank you for um, presenting today, Rick, and I wanna thank everyone for attending. Um, do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, I just, again, wanna say thank you to Trusted CI. And I appreciate the time I spent as a uh, fellow and the framework implementation guide and the framework itself. Um, I think as you can see from its adoption, it really does help projects when they hit that level of, we can't just do this in our lab with our university or other organizational resources, we have mm -hmm. to grow. Um, and this is a much better stepping stone than as I said, jumping full into the jargon that's out there when people start to think about compliance and security. I totally agree. Thank you. Um, well, with that, I'm going to wrap things up. Thanks everyone for attending. And I will be sending the video for this out later today. Uh, have a great day, Rick. Thank you very much. And um, see you next time.